and, and you end up with uh, a band of extremely heavy precipitation, snowfall in a lot of cases. So we're going to go over, well, first of all, I should credit some of the people. Uh, some, some people in the past have done some great work on banding and uh, taken some of their ideas and used them towards this presentation. So I just want to acknowledge them. Basically, what I want to do is give an overview of uh, why this happens and why it's a forecast problem. Because uh, be forecasting six to 12 inches of snow, and in some cases, you get a band form and you end up with 18 to 24 in a few hours' time. Uh, it's happened in several cases, especially uh, what I want to focus on. You know, on, this is February 12, 2006, New York City band. Because I worked the event when I was working at the Upton office. Um, it was very, very uh, interesting play by play. Every hour, something was changing. <clears throat> So why study mesoscale banding? I just have a few uh, images here of uh, a couple of storms that have happened in the past. Uh, January 7, 2002, you have a really broad area of uh, moderate snowfall. And right in the middle of that band, or this band pops out where they've had almost two feet of snow. You really want to um, you really want to try to forecast that because, uh, because of public impact. And you can have locally crippling snowfall in a very short period of time. Uh, and this is what we're trying to get at. It's really hard to forecast sometimes. Sometimes you can look at the models and try to pick out if there's going to be band formation at all, but where it's going to be, that's the big question. And we still really don't know, because a lot of times the models are wrong, because it's such a mesoscale feature. <clears throat> so here's uh, 2006, February 12th. And this was the one from January 7, 2002. It's a pretty famous one uh, from February 7, 2003. Uh, basically, you see it here, you know, three to six inches uh, north of the Mass Pike. Uh, down in Southeast Mass, they got a decent amount. But right in here, what was it snowing? Like three, four inches an hour for a time just south of Boston, and it yep. wasn't forecasted. Right. Um, we didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> well, some people did, I guarantee you that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Here's a storm that I, I experienced. I was living, uh, I think I was, I was living on Long Island at the time, but I happened to be visiting a friend in East Long Meadow, Massachusetts, that day, and uh, we had, um, we were measuring, and we had 24 inches of snow in 12 hours. And the, these contours aren't that great, but in this general area here, you had 20 plus inches, uh, and on either side of that, much lesser amount. So you want to try to forecast these things. And mostly what we want to talk about here are single bands. Uh, you can have banding that takes the shape of multiple bands. Uh, it might be two or three. Uh, but what we want to focus on are these big, long uh, bands that produce uh, snowfall rates two to four inches an hour. Uh, they're generally uh, greater than 250 kilometers in length. And they can be very skinny, uh, a lot of times less than 100 kilometers, uh, down towards 20 kilometers or so. Uh, 30 dBZ minimum, a lot of times in this band you'll see at least 35 to 40 dBZ snow in there. And uh, they last uh, at least two hours, uh, but mesoscale snow bands don't last on the order of days, they last on the order of hours, and we'll show why this is. Mesoscale snow bands happen on the northwest side for the most part, uh, above the level lows or actually your surface low, and if your surface low is here, most of the mesoscale banding is <coughs> in the northwest of the surface low. Sometimes you do have it on the front end, supposed, uh, so usually associated with uh, uh, low level jet or speed convergence. A single banded event duration, they don't last all that long. Most of them last between two and six hours. And uh, we see that, like, say a snowstorm lasts 12, 18, sometimes 24 hours. Um, these bands embedded within the greater snow field are only going to last between two and six hours. Some of them last longer. So we look at the scales of, uh, of forcing or for ascent to get your precipitation going. You have your cyclone scale where you're looking at. Uh, Warm air vorticity advection, maybe pick out things like uh, 
your cold, your conveyor belt, your warm conveyor belt, your cold conveyor belt. You get down into the frontal scale, where frontogenesis uh, on the scale of 100 kilometers, sometimes less, you get these banding features. And then even on the cell scale, a uh, really small scale, just uh, 10 kilometers or less. But what we're focused on here is the frontal scale, uh, which is, uh, has to do with mesoscale meteorology. So that's what we're going to look at. You talk about frontogenesis and deformation bands, so we want to kind of get into that, get the terminology down. It's pretty simple. Frontogenesis means you're forming a front. It doesn't have to be at the surface. Most of the time <coughs> in these cases, it's uh, in the mid-levels of the atmosphere. So basically, your initial state, you have cold air to the north, very simply, warm air to the south. And what happens is you can converge the two air masses, and what's going to end up happening is that your isotherms are going to become more tightly packed. And that's basically how a front forms, very simply. Uh, and this is, has to do a lot with this banding, and we'll show why. Hi. <laughs> basically, what happens in uh, mesoscale, uh, or say like in mesoscale frontogenesis, you have your cold air infection from the north, your warm air infection from the south. This basically kicks um, the thermal wind balance. The atmosphere always wants to be in balance. Uh, geostrophic balance, we call it, like thermal wind balance. The atmosphere doesn't like to be disrupted. But when frontogenesis occurs, it knocks your thermal wind out, out of balance. What it causes is a circulation in the vertical which enhances your upward vertical motion. And that's why frontogenesis is so important. We'll show some examples of this coming up. So if you look in a, like a vertical cross section, <coughs> this is up and this is uh, your x-axis is say uh, north to south across a frontal band. This red area is your area of frontogenesis. You have frontogenesis at the surface, the mid-levels, all the way up to, say, 500 millibars, and it slopes back towards the cold air. So it's kind of slanted. And this is your area of frontogenesis. And what happens is, is your atmosphere becomes out of thermal wind balance. It really needs to rebalance itself. <coughs> so what you end up doing is you start a circulation that causes lift on the warm side of the frontogenesis, and you get cooling on this side, and sinking air on the cold side of the frontogenesis band, and you get warm, and that's how the atmosphere tries to get itself back into balance. But when this is happening on the warm side of the band, you're going to get, instead of just your warm air infection lift or whatever, you're going to end up enhancing that lift in a very small area. And this is where your band's going to form, and we'll show that. Frontogenesis results from uh, deformation. Basically, uh, in a simple form, you're, you're taking your air parcels and you're distorting them somehow. Say you have a northerly flow, it's kind of divergent here. You end up tightening up your band or whatever's there, uh, your air mass or your air parcel, it'll end up being stretched and it'll tighten the gradient of whatever your, like say, temperature along that a a axis right here. So. If you have a temperature gradient in this area, then it's going to act to tighten the temperature gradient. Uh, there's other ways you can get frontogenesis through adiabatic cooling and warming, or if you're cloudy on the side of a front and sunny on the other, you're going to warm up this area. That's going to stay cold, so you're going to form a front in there. But this is what we're really interested in. 